Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are two musicians, flutist Susan Greenberg and guitarist Lawrence Juber, who is the musical director of a, of a musical called The Housewives. Soloist, chamber musician, symphony player, Susan Greenberg grew up in Oakland, California, where she started playing the piano at the age of seven and the flute at eight. She soloed with both the o Oakland and San Francisco symphony orchestras while she was still in high school. High school didn't last very long because by the time she was 16, she was at UCLA working on a BA and an MA in historical musicology. Susan's played flute with the Roger Wagner Chorale, the LA Philharmonic, the New York City Opera, the LA Chamber Orchestra, and she's taught at CalArts Occidental College in Pepperdine. How did you find a teacher to motivate you at the age of seven? Well, we had a piano teacher that lived down at the end of the block. My parents weren't terribly sophisticated, and nobody was in music, and I used to go down and play on somebody's piano and I said I want to learn the piano. I was so terribly self-motivated. So you were self-motivated. Right. Did she teach you the right way, do you think? You know what, back? actually looking back, it, I was very fortunate because not only did I have piano lessons, but every week we'd have a little theory lesson. She'd have all the kids come to her house and I'd learn all the things that most kids don't have a chance to learn young, all the scales and keys. and she I still, really, So she really did set a foundation. Yeah, it was good. And then at school a year later I somehow wanted, thought I wanted to play the flute and um, I remember there were two of us that wanted the flute and the teacher looked at the other girl's <laughs> hands and he said, I think I'll give you the uh, violin and they gave me the flute. So that's, do you think you would have ended up with the violin? I could have, <laughs> it wouldn't have been a bad thing. There are lots more violins that are needed in, in an orchestra. Are but, there, is that right? Yeah, there's only just, you know, two or, there are only two of us in the LA Chamber Orchestra and 16 violins, but in a big orchestra, the proportions are even larger. Yes, but you stand out, don't you? Yeah, we do. That's <laughs> absolutely true. And I grew up, unfortunately, in a household where I was to be seen and not heard. And it was very good. My music really served um, for me to be heard heard and seen or not seen. Is that? That was a... So you're, you continued your music in high school. I did. I was very were... involved. and. Um, how did you get to the symphony orchestras when you were still in high school? You mean to play? To play, well, yes. Well, you know what, ever since I was in elementary school, my, I remember in sixth grade my mom sent me to a summer program and I was like first chair flute and there were 12th <coughs> graders, but I was, you know, sort of blindsided just going through my life and then I played in all the honor orchestras and by the time I was in high school I was already taking a bus and going out to UC Berkeley and playing in their symphony orchestra. Did you have to audition or did they just know you were good? Um, <laughs> no, no, it seems to me there were usually auditions along the way. And did, But your music teachers must have Yeah, said, right, exactly, they encouraged worked me. With. And I actually wasn't even going to major in music. I graduated young and I was going to go to Berkeley and major in English and I got a scholarship on any campus and I remember I'd go through the catalog and I'd see Chaucer and I'd go, oh, yuck, and I'd go back to M after music. English and go to music and say, oh. And uh, so, so at the very last minute, I decided we, we didn't really have a lot of money and my parents weren't too sophisticated. My dad had died and I had a choice between San Francisco State or UCLA. My music teacher said, you really shouldn't go to Berkeley. You should major in music. You know, and I thought, I don't know what I'll do in it, but I'll take his advice. But if you got a scholarship to UCLA, which wasn't a music school, did you think about going to like the Berkeley School or the school you know in what? Philadelphia? It, it, was, it wasn't even a choice. I mean, I, it was either I was going to just go to a UC. It seemed like oh, the thing just, to do. I you know, see, as I, I say, I was only 15 and anyway, it worked out well because I did a lot of my performance outside of UCLA. I oh, went to so the Music Academy of the West, and then I was a scholarship recipient at Tanglewood, and oh, so you I went to France and studied, and I did a lot of work, um, and I thought, well, I have a degree in case it doesn't work. 
in, in music. In music history, and I taught at junior colleges when I was very young to make money, so, and then all of a sudden. So, so do you think that UCLA, just being there, opened these other doors, or were you looking absolutely. for places? Absolutely. No, the, the UCLA opened the doors because I was um, playing with Roger Wagner, who was conducting, and he auditioned me, and, oh. and I got first flute to travel around the world with him with an orchestra, and we went to Europe, we played the B minor mass, and we played... When, when was that? That was in 19... I mean, after school, after UCLA? No, during, during UCLA. I took off a year, during, and that was oh. 65 to 66. Oh, it was. And I went on a concert tour all over the U.S. You said first flute. What's first flute? First flute is principal flute. That's the one that um, is more exposed and, you know, has more responsible part. And You uh, play more? You do. Or you, and you have the solo parts. There's usually two. And um, I play second flute and piccolo with the L.A. Chamber Orchestra, so uh, I'm not always on the hot seat. But, but uh, you call it a hot seat, or is that the glory seat? It's kind of both. <laughs> it's a, a mixed, mixed thing. You know, you have more responsibility, but it's, it's more Are fun. there In what way? Because is a first violinist, and is there a first bassist? Is there a yes. first mm -hmm. everything Yeah, like they that? get more money. No. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. is that part yeah, of that? Yeah, that's part of each section where you have a principal. Actually, the word should principal. be principal player. And, um, and do they lead the other people? Yes. What is their, their yeah. responsibility? Yes, um, they're often in charge of their section and... Um, do you rehearse them? No, 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 no. We're at the stage where you don't tell other... You try not to tell other people how to play unless it's really necessary. But you, but and as far as responsibility... Right, your part's heard more often and... I see, you I know. see. So, since, Since you have had all of this experience, you've had two concertos written for you. Yes, I was fortunate with um, local composers, um, Bruce Broughton, who's a film composer and a classical composer. Um, contemporary? Um, oh, he did, he, he did a contemporary? Yes, he did a piccolo concerto for me, which actually has had play all around the world now. And it's been published, and lots of people play it. And I premiered it in 92 here in oh, L.A. Oh. And actually, I'm going to do it again next season. There's a wind band arrangement that I'm going to do with uh, the Pierce uh, Symphonic Wind Orchestra. What is that? What's just a wind orchestra? Wind orchestra is uh, woodwinds and, and brass, no strings. No and, strings. Yeah. And, uh, so how many? Do they double up on yeah, everything? Yeah, well, many, many. It's like a band. Right. Oh, it's more you know, like, like a band. I have a couple students that play there, must, adult students. It must be 10 flutes. Ten clarinets, and we talked about the piccolo. And right, the flute. and then another, so another, tell another us a bit. Um, composer wrote a concerto just oh. recently that I played with the LA Chamber Orchestra for um, three instruments because he knew that I played all of them. One was the piccolo. So the piccolo is small. is the smallest and sounds the highest, and then the C flute is the regular flute that people play most often, and then the alto flute. So there's two kinds of flutes? Actually, there are four. Oh. When I played in the studios, for years I was a flutist for Star Trek, and I still play the, for The Simpsons, and we used a lot of bass flute and alto flute in, in movies and television. So bass flute, alto, alto flute, flute C. C flute, and piccolo. Piccolo gets counted in that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I got an ergonomic alto flute. What usually, does that mean? Usually the alto flute is extended like this, in a long line, and... Um, I got sick of having to play down here. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah, and my wrist was, you know, it really, I didn't like it. And so I invested in this instrument that I had to buy to get both head joints, and now it's very ergonomic. And Did I, you restructure it? No, 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 no. Oh, they, they sell it and make it. And Oh, they do. Yeah. So, how, so what did it save you, this It this saved piece? me so that my hand is very relaxed, closer to my body, and plays just like a flute instead of being down here. And, and when it was down there, where was the mouthpiece? <laughs> way up, oh, way up there. Oh, I see what you, oh. Yeah, the mouthpiece was up here. Oh, and Most people play that, but you know what? I was getting tendonitis, and I thought, Oh, I see. So you the know, mouthpiece is the same, but it was, I got Not so, it. such I a far stretch. And, you know, it's really sometimes abusive. I mean, I've worked morning, afternoon, and evening. I used to play, uh, played with the New York City Opera and then the L.A. Opera, and I would do studio calls all day, and you know, it's a lot of sitting in one position. What are the sounds of these different ones? Well, <laughs> hi. Piccolo, and the flute is. And this and one is really alto flute. Here, let me put on 
Wow. It's actually interesting, the head join is what determines the sound on an instrument. And um, that's what you're putting on? Yeah, this is the one I'm used to. Let's see where to put it here. Fabulous. Wow. You can really hear the difference, and it's something for us to look for. You do Chamber Music Palisades. Yes, You're a co-founder. Tell us right. about that. Thank you for asking. That's our, <laughs> this because is our, you play this. Right. This all. is our 12th season, and Alan Chapman, who's uh, the host on KUSC USC Radio, is our host, <laughs> right. and he talks people through the concerts. We have four Tuesday evenings during the season. We have people from the L.A. Philharmonic, the L.A. Chamber Orchestra, international stars and we're commissioning Alan's piece actually in October he wrote a piece Alan for Alan Chapman? Yes, he's a very fine composer. And so you get people from all around the city right. to come in and play in the chamber symphony. Right, actually What's it's not a different? symphony, it's oh. just chamber music oh, okay. and we usually have anywhere between four and six people playing and my cohort oh. Dolores Stevens plays piano and I play flute and then we have this, may I? This next oh, yes, season, sir. actually, we have um, a range of different concerts. Uh, one is the first one is with woodwinds and narrator, and another one is with uh, clarinet and viola and piano. One is with harp, and another with string quartet. Tell me what the difference is, though, between chamber and philharmonic. Yeah, is the there? philharmonic um, probably would have maybe 100 to 120 musicians. That's the LA Philharmonic, and they do very large repertoire. I play with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, and we have 40 people. Oh, oh And so I it's see. a smaller orchestra, and we do repertoire that's appropriate for us, I see, which can I see. include almost anything. I see. In fact, we just, but you just narrow it's it down? It's a smaller. And I then see. chamber music can be anything usually from a duo, trio, quartet, maybe to an octet. So oh. chamber music are smaller forces with and yet different repertoire. I see. And what do we call you, a flutist or a flautist? Well, I'm a, I'm a flutist because I play the flute, but my husband says I flout around. <laughs> but what is yeah, but actually it's, it's, it's the same thing. And somehow, not so many years ago, it became more in vogue here in America to say flautist. Um, in Europe, it comes from flautista, uh -huh. Italy, or flutist, flutiste in France, or flautist in England. Oh, so they pick, you I know, see. but it's, people do it, but I, it sounds a little pretentious to me. And just, and just before we leave, yes. you mentioned that you played in over 400 films, and you actually were the first person or first um, musician group on The Simpsons oh, at yes. the Inception. Well, what do I you think play? the second year, I play flute and alto flute and piccolo. So but is it an orchestra? It is an orchestra, and we record almost every week or every other week each season, so that all the little snippets that you hear our original music. Oh, so now we'll have to look yeah. for that, and we'll have to go to the chamber music in the Palisades. Thank you very much. Thank you, There's Susan. And don't go away, because we're going to be back with another musician, composer, guitarist, Lawrence Juber. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Guitarist, composer, Lawrence Juber, who was born in East London and is a third-generation Cockney, earned a music degree at London University while playing guitar in the West End musicals. Lawrence soon became the in-demand studio player. He played lead guitar on the Oscar-nominated uh, soundtrack of The Spy Who Loved Me. He won a Grammy for a Back to the Egg album. <gasps> that was Paul, with Paul McCartney's, yeah. wasn't it, with uh, his band Wings. And then he moved to the U.S. in the 80s. He worked on classic TV shows, big films, and has written musicals. Where do we begin with you, Lawrence? <laughs> Let's go back to London at right. age 11 yeah. and then 14. How are you playing this, this instrument? Well, I kind of fell in love with pop music when I was a kid. And uh, we had an English artist named Cliff Richard, who was kind of the English Elvis. And uh. <laughs> he had a backing group called The Shadows, who were an instrumental, kind of twangy guitar instrumental. It's like The Ventures were here. 
And I loved that sound, and I just kind of nagged my parents for a guitar. And my dad really wanted to see me play the saxophone. Oh, he did want you to be musical. Well, because <laughs> he, he was a big a fan of big band music. And uh -huh. so I said, all right, I'll learn to play the clarinet at school. Uh, but I kind of cunningly arranged it so I was the last on the list, and they ran out of clarinet. <laughs> and then for my 11th birthday, I got a guitar, and I just never put it down. So that was it? Were you musical on your own, or did you have to take lessons? Or? I took some lessons, and I taught myself some stuff. Did you? And my dad took me to a friend of his who was kind of an amateur dance band guitarist who showed me some, <laughs> some kind of more grown-up chords but, and stuff but like that. But at that age, you were saying you were uh, focusing on being a studio. Yeah, Why? I think, well, Why not a soloist? Why not a band? <laughs> I was kind of a shy adolescent, uh. and, and I was also really challenged by the idea of, of mastering this instrument. And, and I was not just stuck in one particular style of music. I was really a fan of many different styles, classical music and jazz and rock and roll. And, and, and it just, when I learned that, that you could make a living being a studio musician, I thought, well, oh. that, that's a good career goal for me. I'm 13 years old. I love this <laughs> instrument. And that's what I want to do. But, but was this kind of a Cockney thing? What is a Cockney thing? A Cockney, well, <laughs> Let's Cockney, talk about te that. Technically, you, you have to be born within a certain area of East London ah. to be a Cockney, which it, I was. I was born in the East End of London, uh, which gives me license to drop my H's. Yeah. I was just going to yeah. say, I think all we think about when we hear Cockney is a way of speaking. We didn't. We well, don't because know it's, a it's, it's a geographical thing. It's it's within the sound of, of Bow Bells, the the church in in Bow, in East East London. If you could hear the bells, then you were a Cockney. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and then how? And, and, and my then, dad was born in that area, and his dad was born in that area. But we moved out when I was about three. Oh, we so you didn't pick the, up that uh, a little bit. But uh, you know, over the years, it kind of got. You know, Is it good to out. have or not good to have? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. <laughs> <laughs> when you were when you were thinking of doing uh, being in the studio uh -huh. and you were playing, did you ever think of conducting? No, um, I, I still only esoteric? think about conduct. Conducting is, I mean, that's a real skill, you know, to to be able to conduct an orchestra. Um, I mean, I've I've taken some classes in conducting, but from what I, I think that what happened with me was that. I was a guitar player by, by passion. I was passionate about the instrument. But I was also, you know, I'd take a, 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 an, an album, you know, in those days, you know, vinyl albums, and I'd slow it down, and I'd figure out stuff, and then I'd listen and figure out what the trumpets were doing or what the trombones were doing, and I'd listen to records on the radio and listen to the bass line, and I, I just kind of deconstructed music. And as a studio musician, I, w I was intrigued by the, by the way that music was put together that I'd have to invent little guitar parts to make something sound like a pop record. But, but that is probably what a conductor does, too. Not exactly, no. No? No. What a conductor does is basically stands in front of an orchestra, waves a baton, and, and keeps it together and shapes the interpretation. Mm. I'm much more of a composer and an orchestrator where I'll, I'll take a piece of music and arrange it as I do right now, for example, I'm composing for a, a video game score that this. I'll write for, for violins and cellos, you know, for strings and brass and woodwinds. And, but I'll tend to not conduct because I'm I just see. not very good at it. But you when, know, you you have compose, to be good at when you compose, when you compose, that helps you then when you say you deconstruct yeah, it. Yeah, that deconstruction definitely helps because what happened was I went to London University, got a degree in music, and, and I studied all kinds of music from medieval period through, you know, all kinds of like electronic stuff. And this was in London in the early 70s. And I never really had ambitions to be a composer. But then over the years, well, after I'd, I, you know, I did my, my stint as a studio musician in London and got to play on oh, yeah. big movie scores like The Spy Who Loved Me, which was very exciting, because I got to play the James Bond theme, which was really, you know, the coolest thing. And you stood out, right? Well, you know, I was yeah. the soloist. There, yeah. <laughs> you were the soloist. Um, but I was still, you know, it wasn't until I joined Wings that I had any inkling of, of getting up on big stages and being a Is featured right? performer. Yeah, I, I, I was like, I enjoyed the process. You're shy. I, I was a lot more shy. I, I kind of outgrew well, it. Well, how did Wings happen? 
that was through being a studio player. I was working on a TV show with an artist named David Essex, who was a big pop star oh, yeah. in England. And I was the lead guitarist in the house band. And Denny Lane, who was one of the members of Wings, was a guest on the show. And Denny was the original lead singer for the Moody Blues and sang the, their first hit, Go Now, which we did on this show. And I played a guitar solo and he liked my playing. So we kind of bonded. And then about six months later, I was asked to go in an audition which was a challenge because I didn't know any Wings tunes. So it was a, a challenge <laughs> It was a you. challenge for the, from the perspective that I wasn't really familiar with, with the repertoire. Uh, so I borrowed some album, albums from my brother who did have some Wings records. Was he a musician and, too? No. No, no he, he, he just a graphic, had graphic design. <laughs> um, but he was a fan. So I listened and then I went into the audition and it was very friendly and we didn't even play any Wings tunes. We played some Chuck Berry things. And, and how long did that last? The, the, the gig lasted three years. And you were on stage all the oh, time? Just on stage <laughs> and in the studio. And, uh, did you having, have groupies around oh, you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but but, to, but the, the important thing though was that as much as I got my bachelor's degree from London University, I got my master's from McCartney University. Oh, right. And so I learned a lot about what it meant to be an artist, what it meant to be a, a songwriter and, and a composer. And then subsequently after I left Wings, and I moved to New York, and then I met Hope, my wife, who became my wife, in New York, and she was from L.A., so I moved out to L.A. Oh, I was going to ask you, what yeah. brought you to the U.S.? Uh, what well, did? I, ambition. Oh, you, so you came ambition. to New Ambition. I'd been spending, I, first time I went to New York on doing publicity with Wings, it was like, I like this place. I wouldn't mind living here. Oh. So I lived there for six months, then moved to L.A., and then established myself as a studio musician here, and then started getting asked to compose things. And then all the stuff I'd learned in college suddenly became useful. Oh, they asked you to compose yeah, in the I was studio? Getting, yeah, I was getting asked to write songs, and I got, I got offered a movie score, um, I, some TV stuff, and it just it kind of developed. And then Hope had this Tell idea. Tell us about Hope. When did you meet her and We how? met in 1981. I picked her up in a bar. At a Ooh, <laughs> no, you didn't. I did, in, in a well, comedy club in New York called Catch a Rising Star, where I would go every night and watch Robin Williams and, oh. and Richard Belzer and Gilbert Gottfried and Bill Maher. All the people that subsequently became very you know, well-known names were all kind of honing their craft. And I watched stand-up performers uh. like that. And I thought, you know, I can play guitar and do what they do with comedy, I can do with guitar. And so that was the beginning of the ambition of being a guitar soloist. But I met Hope there and she said, you know, I have this idea for a group called the Housewives. Oh, she I wanna, actually did. She it came up the with the housewives. idea. Yeah, she came up with the idea in 1978 before we met in '81, and she and and she said, you know, you have the musical know-how and I have the comedy know-how. Let's do this. So mm -hmm. after we got married and we had our first child, Nico, um, we put together a group called the Housewives, and we did like Skippy Lowe's talent showcase at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel on a Monday night, and I'd be wearing like overalls and carrying vacuum cleaners and they thought we were the cleaning crew. <laughs> you were the um, housewives. And, and, and I, you know, I just back them up on guitar and then it kind of, we developed a repertoire, went through various incarnations until the point in the early 90s where we had really a functional performing band that was doing a lot of clubs and TV shows. Really was a band? There was a band and we had this repertoire of songs that we had written. Uh, some collaboratively but, but around the core of uh -huh. Hope and I writing together. And then we shelved it because we got we could get so far with it, and then it just the business of it just wasn't going where we wanted it to go. Um. So we put it to one side, and we always said, you know, that would have been so good if we could have done it theatrically. But Hope said, well, I, I just can't imagine <laughs> doing it as a musical. That how why would people burst into these songs? You know, songs. Um, like in sync and at your disposal. Yes, you know, and my love is like board? a faucet, baby. I'm running hot and cold for you. You know, ironing board. Uh, we have this great song, "Pledge or Behold." There's about the confusion that you, you the option anxiety you get with com consumer choices. Exactly. Dial like, double zest, Colgate Gleam or Crest, Pepsodent or Close Up. You know, oh, it's that's like, an Pepsodent or. Well, that's Crest part of the lyric. Is, you know, it's and and when we wrote it, it was kind of a protest song about you know the the just getting too much consumer choice uh -huh. and it was always kind of I always liked that song because it had this kind of interesting anthemic quality to it you know in the end it's like how do you choose between pledge or behold I don't even know if they make behold anymore <laughs> but um, so we went to see Jersey Boys 
last year. And Hope had this epiphany that, well, you don't have to integrate the songs into the action in such a way that people burst into song in the middle of a scene. You can do performances, as long as you tell a good story. And Jersey right. Boys tells a great story. Yes. So, so what happened was we, she got together with her, her partner, Ellen Gilas, who, who is a TV sitcom writer, as is Hope. Um, she has those skills. And they wrote this fantastic story. And that's, it's The Housewives. Uh, it's The Housewives tells a story of a woman named Le Rebecca who calls in a plumber to fix her sink. <laughs> And he recognizes her as being a member of this band that was in the context oh, of the he story. he remembers it. And, and this is all fictional now. Right. You know, we're not really telling the story of what we did. We're just using the songs. In the story, this band was huge. They were w one of the biggest bands of all time. But this woman went, like, became, like, um, just went underground. She became uh -huh. uh, living anonymously, didn't want to have anything more to do with it. He recognizes her, and she tells him the background story. And so the whole musical is done. She's telling the story to her plumber, who spends half oh, the time I under see. the sink. I see. And then it flashes back to the three so women of the housewives and, and tells their story through song. We have, we have projections, so there's graphics. Goofy um, songs. Goofy songs, goofy but, songs. But, good, but really good, still good pop songs. Oh, that's so, the thing. So there's yeah. a, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's humor in the lyrics, and right, you, you want to pay it. attention because there's, there's joke after joke. That's what I thought was so yeah. great. But, but they're also catchy foot tapping songs, so it's very entertaining. Um, it's at the White Fire. It's at the White it's Fire a small Theater. Theater. It's a 99 seat. Uh, the, 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 uh, there is no way that this show is going to continue to run in a theater that size. Do this we, is just to launch it. Do we go to Broadway? Do we go to off Broadway? Uh, we couldn't do it off Broadway. The show's too big to do off Broadway. Is it? Yeah, you Even can't if do you're in an a 99? You can't do the economics of an off Broadway production. You can't have more than four performers. And we have oh. a pretty full cast. I think there's nine, nine performers in the show. Well, I think uh, it's going to be running there a long time. And we well, thank let's you. Hope so. We let's thank you for thank coming. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. You're very well. And thanks. Uh, email me, jaquinn1 at aol.com. And you can write 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time. Thanks.